the first time I really remember somebody saying something that really made it obvious to me that I was different than my mom, who's white, um, was when I was in elementary school, um, or middle school, excuse me. Uh, I think I was in sixth grade. And we went to do the parent-teacher conference, you know, that you do at the beginning of the year. And it's me, you know, looking like me. And then uh, my white mom walking around to the classes with me and everything. The first day of classes, we took like kind of a placement quiz uh, of sorts. And so I took my quiz and I finished before a lot of the other people. And I gave her my, my quiz. And the teacher said, I was wondering if you would be able to share with me, where did your mom get you? And I was like, um, her uterus. Uh, and she was like, no, no, like, you know, I'm, I've been thinking about adopting. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not adopted. Like, people can have babies who look like me, even though they look like my mom. You just got to add some extra chocolate. Like, and I tried to, like, laugh it off, but it really made me upset. Like, I couldn't, um, couldn't fathom that an adult would, like, you know, ask a child something that seems so obvious. But I'm a six-foot-tall guy with dreads and tattoos, uh, and most people don't know I'm biracial until I talk about it. And so I think I've gotten a lot of things that have happened in my life. As biracial people, I think we are constantly trying to define what our identity is and like what's acceptable because sometimes we're not black enough for our black friends and sometimes we're not white enough for our white friends and sometimes we're watered down black and you know, sometimes people try to parade us as their black friend because we, you know, it's just, there's so much I think that goes into our identity and, and making sure that we are grounded and understand who we are. Um, that little things like that can bother you for years and years and years. And you always think back to that moment, like, Ugh, I can't believe uh, that that happens. And you know, any person who's ever been biracial in the history has probably had somebody at some point go, what are you? And that continually happens um, to today. Being biracial and, you know, aware of multiple, multiple cultures and, and, you know, gender identities and religions and all that kind of stuff, I think has helped me and Berea exposed me to all that stuff. And it's given me a place at the table where I can sit and I can view different places and understand where they're coming from. Before I came back to coach, I was on a college tour doing uh, comedy and hosting a game show. Um, while I was here as a staff member the first time, my first stint with Berea, I actually helped lead a class to Uganda with Michelle Tooley. Um, and uh, while there, one of my host brothers really was interested in Berea. And so he applied and he ended up coming here. Um, and I, of course, took him under my wing because that's my host brother. He's here now. He's in my place. Um, the same way he treated me in Uganda, I wanted to treat him here. And we drove up and we went to Boston and New York and got to stay in like nice hotels and see all this stuff. And it was a great experience. Um, and on the way home, we were coming through Pennsylvania and there was ice on the road and I had to drive this big van because I ran the game show and so we had a lot of equipment in the back and uh, so we were we were driving and uh, a semi truck changed lanes I had to get over quickly and I slid on the ice and kind of overcorrected and like kind of spun off of the road and off of the interstate now uh, in Georgetown I was always taught if you ever have an issue like a wreck um, if, if there's no damage then you know you don't have to call anything crazy but like call the police because state troopers especially should have a tow truck who can help you or whatever one state trooper showed up and i was outside of the van but on the opposite side of where he was um and he was walking up and he was like how are things going i was like well i've been better you know we had some small talk and he was looking down trying to make sure he was treading the right way and as soon as he came around the front of the van you know he saw me and immediately his hand went to his gun and uh and he was like i'll be back and he walked back up the hill and got in his car and I was like okay and my host brother David is like what's going on I'm like well um, I think he saw us and David said what do you mean And I'm like well he saw us like because we look like the way we look sometimes people treat you a little differently and it was confirmed when there was five other police cars who showed up so now I'm like okay David so you know this is gonna be a thing so I was like whatever you do do what he says keep your hands where he can see them and don't move fast and um the, like the fact that i had to explain that <laughs> is troublesome i think and a very bad representation of of the united states and, and the experience here i went to uganda and i was able to go wherever i wanted to and david and i had a great time when i was there so for him to come here we've had this wonderful weekend 
And now, like, I have to explain to him how you act when a cop pulls you over. Um, because I guarantee his parents didn't have that, have that conversation when he was in Uganda. Was, was rough and very hurtful and tragic, I guess is the best way to put it. We hand them their IDs. They run back to their car to run a background, I guess. Um, and then finally a tow truck shows up and drags me out of there. Um, and, you know, we're on the side of the road. And then the officer asks if he can look in the vehicle. And I'm like, yeah, that's fine. I mean, I, I run a game show. And he's like, oh, okay. And so I had to show him our website of the game show, what we do. He looks through the vehicle, obviously doesn't find anything crazy, um, any crazier than what was on the game show, of course. But, and so like this whole process, I'm like, are you serious right now? And so then he gives me a ticket. And I said, what are you giving me a ticket for? And he said, well, reckless driving. And I said, you understand that I called you guys. Like you didn't pull over and find me. You didn't pull me over. You didn't see me cause anything. I didn't cause any damage. I slid off the road because there's ice on your road. Well, if you have a problem, you can call the courthouse. And so then he and his friends all got in their car and they drove off. And I was so angry that I literally drove to the next exit, which was like a mile and a half away and pulled off the exit and like just sat there. And David, of course, was like, you good? Like, and I'm like, we need to get something to eat because I'm trying to calm down and not lose my mind in front of him because the experience already was so bad that I don't want to bring too much attention to it. But at the same time, I am stewing uh, and so mad. Um, so that was like, it was just, it was horrible. And it was just literally the ignorance of five cop cars worth of people. Um, the tow truck driver even said, you should have just called me. And I was like, I don't, <laughs> I didn't know, brother. I was raised to trust our police. And so I tried to do that. Um, and most of the time it pays off. But what happens the one time when it doesn't, it can ruin a whole experience um, and show the ugliness of our country. And that's what we have to fix. So this is my third year as the head coach of the women's team. The team is mine. It's a Berea College team, but like I run it, it's mine. Like I have to reflect my values in our team. We do a lot of team building in the beginning and bonding and talking about our backgrounds, where we're from, interesting facts, what our parents do, um, what our experience has been like. But I think also it's important to not ignore what's going on in the world. We get caught up in soccer and we want to play soccer and we want to, you know, we want to compete and we want to do these things. I think it's important to stand for something. My papa used to say, if you don't stand for something, you're going to fall for anything. And so um, when there's something that happens, uh, we as a team talk. Um, and my assistant coach is in on those conversations. I'm in on those conversations. If we have people on the team who can bring us very important insight, I let them speak. And I've seen our team grow, um, not only in the social aspect, um, but also, I think on the field, it helps when you when you look across the field and you see somebody on the other side who has your back, you want to play with them. And I think that'll always be a part of my coaching style, whether I'm at college or at a high school or, you know, if I were to make it to a professional league coaching job at some point, like no matter what's going on, that's always going to be a part of, of what I do, because the things that happen outside of the field, I think are very important to the things that happen on the field.